Okay, we're starting. Hey, good evening, everybody. This week is Pasha's Kisisa, which the beginning of the Pasha speaks about the Machzit HaShekel, the Hat HaShekel. And then it goes into some things about the incense, about the construction of the Mishkan. It goes into the sin of the golden calf and where Hashem forgave Moshe Rabbeinu. But if you know, if you're learning Chitas, you know that the first two aliyahs, Koyen and Levi, are very, very long. The rest of the parsha is not so long, but Koyen and Levi aliyahs are very, very long. And it's brought down in Svarim. The reason for that is because the whole tribe of Levi did not sin in the golden calf. They didn't sin in the eagle. So it's just because the reward for them not sinning in the eagle, Hashem gave them these two long Aliyas of Kohen and Levi, the first two Aliyas and Shabbos, because to reward them for them not sinning in the eagle. But we find the beginning of the Pasha to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get into other things. Uh, there's the mitzvah Machsus HaShekel. Okay, the Jews had to give a half a shekel. And the, what was the purpose of the half a shekel? Number one, to know how many Jews there were, because you're not supposed to count people, one, two, three, four. So then when you have the half a shekel, you counted half a shekel, and that's how you know how many Jews there were. Uh, another reason for that, because from those half shekels, they brought the daily sacrifices in the base of Migdus, the communal morning and afternoon sacrifices. And because of that, they were able to have everybody's participation in the communal sacrifices because everybody's money went to buy those particular kibbutz. But there's some of this, some are very interesting vart. There's a well-known vart that's brought down all over the place. That the word machatzit half is spelled mem chet tzadik yud so. Okay. It's brought down in Svarim, the Rebbe brings it down also. The middle letter of the word is Tzadik. Right? There's five letters. Mem Ches, Tzadik, Yitzhak. So Tzadik is the middle letter. The two letters next to the Tzadik, before and after, are the letters Ches Yud, which means Chai, which means alive. The letters away from the tzaddik, the beginning and the first and last letter of the word is mem sof, which is mates, dead. So it's brought down in Svarim that a person has to be connected to a tzaddik. The tzaddik is in the middle. If you're connected to the tzaddik, then you're chai, then you're alive. If you're, God forbid, not connected to the tzaddik, then you're messed, it's like you're dead. So this is Tama Avart, everybody, it's a well known. Vart, it's a chsid shabbat that everybody says that the tzaddik's in the middle and then you have chai in it. But the, the question is, we know in Kedusha, everything has to be complete. You make Kiddush, you need to have a complete cup of wine. I mean, whatever you do in Kedusha, you need to have completeness. So the question is, why did Hashem command everybody to give a half a shekel? He could have told everybody to give a complete shekel. Why did he tell him half a shekel? In Kedushi, he give a whole shekel. If he can give a half a shekel, he give a whole shekel. So one of the explanations of this is, and we'll continue when we get into more details of this, and that is that a Jew has to know we are only a half. We're half. Who is the other half? Hashem. Or, who is the other half? Another Jew. In other words, I am incomplete without you. You are incomplete without me. And we both are incomplete without Hashem. But that's why it is a very interesting thing. When the person describes what a shekel is, the Torah says, this is what you should give. Okay? And you should give a half a shekel. And then the Torah says, again, how much is a shekel? 20 gator. Here was a measurement. 20 gator. So therefore, you have to give a half a shekel. How much is a half a shekel? 10, 10 gator, right? A whole shekel is 20 gator. You have to give a half a shekel, that's 10 gator. So the question is, the question asks, why does the Torah have to say 20 gator is a shekel? The Torah is telling you to give a half a shekel. Say, give 10 gator. That's the amount of a half a shekel. 
Torah says you have to give the half a shekel. Then the Torah says a whole shekel is twenty. And now we, it doesn't make sense. Why is the Torah telling us about estimate our shekel? So the answer is like this. Because the Jew, we know the Jew has 10 powers of the soul. 10 kreches, three intellect, three seven, I'm sorry, three intellect, seven emotions, which all together is 10. Why does the Jew have 10 attributes in the neshama? Now, the Rebbe says in Tanya, because the neshama comes from God who has 10 levels, 10 spheres in the world. There's Chachma bin Adas, the 10 levels. So therefore, the neshama, which comes from those 10 levels of godliness, also has 10 levels. So therefore, Chassidus explains that why is the Torah telling us 20 geira is a shekel? Who cares if we have to give a half a shekel? Because the Torah says, what are we a half of? We are a half of a complete picture. Hashem is half, we are half. Together, it's 20. It's an entire greatness. We have to give our part. Then Hashem gives his part. So therefore, the Torah is teaching us it's not enough to give a whole shekel. You have to give only a half a shekel. And there's come another very interesting one-line word. It says, Venus nu at the beginning of the parsha, the second parsha, it says Venus nu each person, now each person should give, you know, the half a shekel. It's one of the few words in Torah that if you read it frontwards and you read it backwards, it's the same word. If you read Venus nu frontwards, it's vav non sof nun vav. If you read it backwards, it's vav nun sof nun vav. Whether you read it frontwards or backwards, it's the same word, way. So it says in Svarim, this is good for appeals, by the way. It says in Svarim that when you give, you get more in return. Don't think you're giving, and therefore I'm giving. The Pasuk says, Vinasno, when you give frontwards, you get backwards. You get back everything that a Jew gives. So Jew has to know whenever they give tzedakah, they're actually going to get back more than what they gave. Okay, so that's the reason why we give a half a shekel. But there's a medrash over here that says like this. Ze yitnu. Ze means this is what you give. So Rashi says, Rashi quotes from the medrash, Rashi says, Helulei kemin shal esh. Hashem showed Meisha Rabbeinu a fiery coin. He says, Hashem says, Ze means you point to it. Hashem says, you see this? Is a fiery half a shekel. This is what you should give. So the Medrash says, Meshir Abenu didn't understand the half shekel. He didn't. He didn't understand the half shekel. So Hashem had to show him a fiery coin. That's what the Medrash says. The difficulty is very simple. How does Meshir Abenu not know what a half a shekel is? Every Jew know Meshav. Meshav Benu, after the Ego was became a very, very wealthy man. Meshav Benu grew up in Paris. Ha. I mean, Meshav Benu knew what a half a shekel is. Why did they have to show Meshav Benu a half a shekel? And if Meshav Benu didn't know what a half a shekel is, what is Hashem showing him a fiery coin? So the explanation is as follows. Meshav Benu knew what a half a shekel was. But the Pasik says, the purpose of the half of shekel was to forgive your soul from the golden calf. From the golden calf. Okay? Meaning, the half a shekel that the Jews gave actually atoned for the sinning in the golden calf. And that's what Meshe Rabbeinu really couldn't understand. Meshe Rabbeinu says to Hashem, how could a lousy half a dollar, how could a, so to speak, a lousy half a shekel, how in the world can that forgive for such a terrible sin as the golden calf? That's what Meshe Rabbeinu didn't understand. Meshe Rabbeinu says, how in the world can a half a shekel forgive for such a terrible sin of worshiping gold, golden calf? 
So then the question is, what does Hashem answer him? A fiery coin. What does Hashem answer him? So the Chassidus explains like this. The fiery coin represents the neshama, the fire of the Jew. Matbea is a coin. Matbea, the Gemara says, a coin, you know, a currency coin has a set amount of value. A half a dollar is a half a dollar. A dollar is a dollar. When it comes to a just piece of metal, a piece of silver, it doesn't have necessarily a set value. It can go up, silver can go up, silver can go down. Gold can go up, gold can go down. But once you make it into a coin, the coin has a set value. And that's perhaps why the Hebrew word for coin is matbea, which is really teva. Matbea is the word teva, nature. There's a limitation to a coin. A coin has, a coin has a certain amount of value. So the question is, the word matbea shall eish, a coin of fire, seemingly is contradictory, because fire represents kedusha, holiness, godliness, infinite level. How can you have a matbea shall eish? So this is what Hashem is telling Moshe Rabbeinu. He says like this, what's the difference between Madveya again and Esh? Fire goes up. Right? Fire goes up. Currency is down here. You can't use currency up there. Madveya represents earth. What is the Aveda of Matbeya Shal Esh is what's called Ratsu Vishaiv, longing and returning. It says by the in the Merkava of Yechesko that we read in the Haftar on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. I'm sorry, first day of Shwis. It says, The Malachim had the longing and the returning. And it says all over the place that a Jew needs to have a longing to God. And at the same time, he needs to understand that Hashem wants us here. Meaning as follows. We all know Nadav and Avihu brought this foreign fire and they went up, they died. Hasidus explains Dorachayim HaKadosh, I'm sorry, Dorachayim HaKadosh brings it down. Dorachayim HaKadosh explains, what was the sin of Nadav and Avihu? They had the longing. They saw godliness. They saw godliness. Such a great revelation, the, 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 the finalization of the Mishkan. They actually couldn't stay in the bodies. They so said, we can't stay in the physical world. We need to go out. So they had this tremendous longing. But that was their sin. Because Hashem doesn't want a one-way ticket out. Hashem wants a return ticket also. Hashem says, yes, a Jew needs to have a longing. A Jew needs to become, want to become close to Hashem. A Jew wants to become, get out of the body. But at the same time, Hashem says, you need to have a matbeya. You need to realize your purpose is here in the world, not to leave. And therefore, Hashem is telling Meshir Rabbeinu a few things over here. Number one, Hashem says to Meshir Rabbeinu, you know, our half a shekel of fire can forgive the golden calf. Hashem said to Meshir Rabbeinu like this. Even a Jew who sins, even a Jew who worshiped the eagle and needs forgiveness, how can he be forgiven if he did such a terrible crime? He, he mamish committed adultery, adultery with God. They worshipped, uh, they took another wife. They took a golden calf. Because every Jew has this neshama, this fire. And that fire is always pure. Maybe the matbeah sinned. Maybe the coin sinned. Maybe the intellect of the Jew sinned. The emotions of the Jew sinned. But Hashem said, you know why the machzitz shekel can forgive the person? 
because when the Jew gives a half a shekel, he real, realizes that it's a connection. God is the second half, and he's longing to become connected to Hashem. Now, the Rebbe says in Tanya, why is a candle, why is not the Shema likened to a candle? Ner Hashem Nishma Sadam. We learned many times. There's a yard take, you light a candle. Somebody is a chiyuv, they daven for the Amid many times, our customs, you light five candles. What does the Nishama have to do with a candle? Kishlam HaMelech says in Mishlei, Ner Hashem Nishma Sadam. The candle of God is the Nishama of man. But Dr. Rebbe explains, what does that mean? Because a flame always flickers. A flame wants to get away from the wick. The second there is no more fuel forcing it to stay down here, the fire goes back up to its source, which Ramam says is under the rotation of the moon, whatever that means. So every Jew has a fire in the Shem, and that's why it's brought down in Svarim. A person learns, a person davening, out of the clear blue, they start shaking. They're shockling. Why are they shaking by, by davening? They're not even aware that they're shaking. Because the neshama at the time of davening wants to get out of the body. The neshama wants to get off the wick, which is the body and the fuel. And the neshama wants to go closer to Hashem. So Hashem says to Meishe Rabbeinu, this is the rots of a shave of a Jew, the matbeah shalesh, even when they sin. A Jew still has the desire to be close to Hashem. And that's how they can be forgiven. And the Rebbe explains, that's why the Pasha begins, the first words of the Pasha is, Ki sisa es reish b'nei Yisrael. Simply it means, I mean, if you take a little, the, the, the loose translation, when you will count the heads of the Jewish people, so you give a half a shekel to count them. But if you take that Pasik literally, Kisisa means when you will elevate, when you will pick up as Reish B'nai Yisrael, the head of the Jew. The Pasik literally says, when you will pick up the head of the Jew. <clears throat> what do you mean pick up the head of the Jew? Where do you pick it up? Take it off the body. So Chassidus explains what it means is the head represents the intellect of the Jew. What does it mean, elevating the head? Elevating the head to a state of belief, emuna, which is above intellect. And therefore, the third by Machtes HaShekel, which had to forgive for the sin of the golden calf, Hashem opens the parsha with the words, Ki sisa as reish b'nei Yisrael, when you will pick up and elevate the head of the Jew, because the head of the Jew might have worshipped the golden calf and might have sinned. Intellectually, the Jew could sin. But what is the solution to the problem? What is the fiery half a shekel? Elevate the head. Forget the intellect. Bring the Jew up to the level of emuna, the level of belief, which is the longing that a Jew has to be with Hashem. And that's Forgiving for the, that's what forgives for the golden calf. And that's why Meish Rabbeinu, not that he didn't know what a half a shekel was. He did know how is it possible that a person who sinned such a terrible sin could be forgiven. <clears throat> and Hashem said, it's a matbeah <clears throat> shalesh. The ten shekel, the ten gator, the ten levels within the Jew, it's a fiery coin. But they sinned. So the Torah says, elevate them. Pick them up. Pick them up to the level of Amuna. Pick, pick them up to the level of Bitochen. Pick them up to the level of fire, of enthusiasm and godliness. Bring them up to the level of Neshama. And that's the way they're forgiven for the golden calf. Because a Jew, no matter who he is, is connected to Hashem. And that's what the Master of Sashakal teaches us. Okay, another, uh, there's a lot of interesting things in this parsha. It's long and it's interesting. Okay, we know Meshe Rabbeinu was up in Har Sinai, so it speaks about in the parasha. And then <clears throat> the Jews said, hey, what happened to this guy Moshe? We don't know what happened to him. So they said, let's go make a foreign god. Okay. So Aaron makes, throws the gold into the fire and the witchcraft is the, the 
the magicians made from the gold that was thrown into the fire, they made the golden cap. Okay? So Hashem says to Meshe Rabbeinu, Ve'yidavar Hashem al-Mesh, Lech Reid. He says, go, translating it literally, go, go down. What does it mean, go, go down? What's the double expression? So Rashi says, go down simply, go down from the mountain to the Jews. And the raid means go down from your greatness. I only gave you greatness because of the Jews. The Jews are no good, neither are you. Meaning, as we all know, when the body falls, the head falls with it. That's what Hashem told my Rabbein. The only greatness you have is because of the Jews. The Jews are sinning. Get lost. Get out of here. You're, you're going down from your own greatness. So we know the order was like this. Meshe Rabbeinu went up to Har Sinai three times, 40 days. Okay? He went up on the 6th of Sivan, Hashem gave the Torah. So on the 7th of Sivan, Meshe Rabbeinu went up to Har Sinai to get the Torah. 40 days later, <clears throat> on the 17th of Tammuz, they broke the Luchis. He came down on the 17th of Tammuz, broke the Luchis. Hashem wanted to destroy the Jewish people. Meshe Rabbeinu went up again 40 days on the 18th, but he always went up in the morning. He came down on the 17th, 17th Shavasa B'Tammuz, broke the Luchis. The next morning he said to the Jews, let me see what I can do for you. Let me try to get forgiveness. Hashem's really angry. And he came down, Erev Rosh Chodesh Elo, the last day of all. Still, the Jews were not forgiven. Then he went up again, Rosh Chodesh Elo, for the third time, 40 days. And he came down on Yom Kippur with the second Luches, and they were forgiven. So now, Meshe Rabbeinu later on in Chumash says, when he's talking to the Jews, he says, you know, I was up there for 40 days. I didn't need to drink for 40 days. But if you think about it, Meshe Rabbeinu was up in Har Sinai three times 40 days. That means he didn't eat or drink for three times 40 days. Maybe the day he came down, he ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't know. But Meshe Rabbeinu didn't eat for three times 40 days. And the Gemara says a very interesting expression. There's two expressions in the Gemara. The Gemara says, Asis lekarta azal benimusa. Simply, it's translated by the Goyim. When in Rome, do as the Romans. Asis lekarta means when you come to a city, azal benimusa, follow the habits of the city. Meaning, like the Gemara says, the Medrash says, the Malachim came to earth, to Avram Avinu, they ate. He gave them food. Because down here you eat. I, the Malachim, don't eat. Yeah, but when you come to earth, Malachim eat. Meshe Rabbeinu went up to heaven. So he didn't. Over there, they don't eat. So therefore, Meshe Rabbeinu didn't eat. So there's a very interesting question that a lot of people ask. And the Rebbe has a whole sikh on this. The Gemara says a din. If a guy swears, makes a vow, he will not eat for seven days. You whip him and put him, make him, force him to eat. Why? Because the person can't live for a week or three days, whatever it is, without food. So therefore, a guy makes such a vow that he can't keep. So then, the then is, he's going to anyway trans, to transgress the vow. So you make him eat anyway, but you whip him. Lashes for making a false vow. If that's the case, Meshe Rabbeinu, didn't eat three times 40 days. How is that possible? How is that possible that Meshe Rabbeinu didn't eat for 40 days times three? And there's three answers between Rambam, Medrash, whatever, there's three answers. One answer is a miracle happened. Hashem made a miracle. Yeah, naturally, a person cannot live so long without food. But Hashem made a miracle that he lasted 40 days without food three times. Another answer, the Rambam writes a matter in the Vuchim, and the guy that is perplexed, that sometimes a person has the ability to control his physical body with his mind. You know, you find many times people 
have such tragedies, they don't eat for a very, very long time. They just don't eat and they don't sleep. So the Ramam writes, there's an ability sometimes, it's rare, but there's an ability that somebody is actually able to control their body physically that they don't eat. That's the second answer. So Meshach Rabbeinu on Har Sinai was so busy learning and, and doing everything he needed to do, he was able to physically control his body that he didn't need to eat. And then there's the third answer. The third answer is that Meshach Rabbeinu nature changed. Yes, a human being needs to eat. Meshach Rabbeinu up in Har Sinai it wasn't a miracle. He he wasn't a person anymore. He became an angel for those 40 times three. Okay? So there's three answers how Meshach Ben was able to exist without it. One was, it was a miracle. One was he had the ability to control himself with mind over matter. And the third one was his body changed. The nature of a body changed that he didn't need to eat. So the Rebbe explains, we know a rule in Theta, they're all right. They're all right. So how do you explain these three answers? That explains it very simply, very beautifully. These are, each one of these opinions was each one of the 40-day differences. First 40 days was a miracle. The first 40 days, Meshach Rabbeinu didn't eat. Why? Because Hashem made a miracle for him. Where do you see the first 40 days were miraculous? Because when Meshach Rabbeinu brought down the luches, it says the luches were the work of God. The writing were the, was the work of God. The letters went through and through miraculously. The whole luches was a miraculous feat. So the first 40 days when Meshach Rabbeinu went up to Sinai, that was the miracle era. And if it was a miracle era, therefore Hashem made a miracle that Meshach Rabbeinu didn't have to eat for 40 days. What was the second days? The second days Hashem was, the second 40 days, Hashem was angry at the world. Hashem was angry at the Jews. He wanted to destroy them. Meshach Rabbeinu was arguing and fighting with Hashem for 40 days to get forgiveness. And when he came down at the end of the 40 days, mission not accomplished. Hashem still didn't forgive him. So what was Meshach Rabbeinu doing on the mountain those 40 days? He was so involved in davening and saving the Jewish people. He, he didn't need to eat. It was the mind controlling the body. He was so busy and occupied with getting forgiveness for the Jewish people. He didn't need to eat. What was the last 40 days? The last 40 days was when Hashem accepted the tshuva of the Jewish people. The Rambam writes that about tshuva is a new person. The Rambam writes in Hilchah's tshuva, about tshuva is a new person. It's not the guy that sinned yesterday. The guy that sinned yesterday is somewhere else. This guy that does tshuva is a new person. So what happened in the last 40 days of Meshach Rabbeinu being on Har Sinai, it actually, his nature changed. It was the level of tshuva. If his nature changed, he didn't need to eat either. But it wasn't because the mind controlled the body. The body is a body needed to eat. No, the body didn't need to eat. He became like a malach. So there's three opinions. How did Meshach Rabbeinu exist? For the 40 days, three times. Each reason applies to a different level of the 40 days. And therefore, what was the miracle? And what was he was so preoccupied with davening? He had no time to eat, so to speak. And he was able to control the body that way. And then he did the last 40 days. It's true. It's interesting. There's a famous story that Rebbe Marash to show the greatness of a tzaddik. The Rebbe Marash one time realized he wasn't hearing from one ear. One ear wasn't working. And he thought, what happened? And he realized that a day or so earlier, Shabbos, whenever it was, he said a Hasidic discourse. And there were people talking on the side. And the talking bothered him. So the way the story told, it's told by the Rabbeim, 
that the Rebbe Rashab turned off that ear, which was next to, in the direction of the people talking that he didn't hear anymore. He controlled his physical body to turn off the ear. And then afterwards, he forgot to turn it back on, so to speak. So then when he realized the next day he wasn't hearing from that ear, he turned it back on. That's an ability people, I mean, not me and you, but, well, me for sure not. But this is an ability of a tzaddik. They have physical control over the body. But it's not that it was a miracle. It wasn't that they that they nature changed. They just had total control of the body. So therefore, we have like this. The first 40 days, the Jews were on the level of tzaddikim. The middle 40 days, not forgiven, the Jews were on the level of roshoim. The third 40 days, Rosh Chodesh Elul, the 40 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul to Yom Kippur, as we know, are days of tshuva. Elul is the month of tshuva, and Yom Kippur is the day of tshuva. So that was the 40, th third 40 days, which we are on the level of a Baal tshuva. Okay, now, there's an acronym for the word Elul. Elul has many, many acronyms. But one of the acronyms for the word Elul is as follows. Aron Luches Veshivre Luches. Okay? Elul stands for the Aron, the Ark, the Luches, the complete Luches, meaning the second set which were complete. Veshivre Luches, meaning the broken Luches. So it says inside the Arden, inside the Ark and the Holy of Holies, there was this full set of Luches that Meshe Rabbeinu came down with on Yom Kippur, plus the broken Luches. Okay? Now, I mean, you could ask a lot of questions like, why in the world would the broken Luches be needed in the, in the, in the, in the Arden? And what is the emphasis Aren luches, the shivre luches, the luches, the broken luches are all under Aren. What, what, what's going on over here? Okay, so let, let me first go off a little bit, then we'll come back to this point. You know, we got the Torah on Shavuos. Matan Torah was on Shavuos. Yet, when do we celebrate Simchas Torah? When do we finish the Torah? When do we start it right away, Bereshis? On Simchas Torah, not on Shavuos. So the Mefarshim Taka ask, why don't we celebrate Simchas Torah on Shavuos? That's when we should, when do we get the Torah? We got the original Luches, the hand of God, on Shavuos, Matan Torah. So that would make sense. You start the Torah then from Bereshis, you finish Zesa Bracha, that would make sense. You say no. Shavuos, there is no Matan Torah. I mean, there's Matan Torah, but you don't start and finish the Torah, finish and start the Torah. When do we finish and start the Torah? On Simchas Torah. Why? Interesting. Another in interesting point. What do we do Shavuos night? COVID, pre-COVID, post-COVID? We're up a whole night learning. That's what the minig is shvuas. You stay up a whole night learning. Why do we do on Simchas Torah? Simchas Torah, we don't learn so much. I mean, you have to do your regular learning. But Simchas Torah, the emphasis is on dancing with a closed Sefer Torah. That's what you do. You dance with a closed Sefer Torah. So the question is, again, it doesn't make sense. On Shavuos, I'm sorry, on Simchas Torah, we're finishing the Torah. We're starting the Torah. We should sit down and learn. Why are we dancing? What are we dancing about? So explanation is like this. The first Luches we mentioned before, the Jews were on the level of Tzadikim. They came out of Mitzrayim. They were a newborn nation. They prepared themselves 49 days of the Omer preparing themselves for receiving the Torah. And Shavuos Hashem came down and gave the Torah to the Jewish people. There were tzaddikim. 
the first luchais represent righteous people. What do the luchashnias represent? The second set of luchais. The second set of luchais, which was given on Yom Kippur, represents the tshuva aspect of Torah. Not the tzaddik aspect of Torah, but rather the tshuva aspect of Torah. Second luchas were given on Yom Kippur. Okay, so the second luchas were given on Yom Kippur. That's when Hashem Moshe Rabbeinu came. What? Yeah. Came down the second time with the luchas. So Hashem says like this. Tzaddikim, the different levels. This guy learns better. This guy learns less. This guy's more religious, more from, more fanatic, less fanatic. There's a million levels. Shuva, everybody's equal. Shuva is a returning to God. Return. You're returning. You return. Doesn't matter where you're, you're returning. You're returning to Hashem. Hashem says, "You know when I can have the real level of simcha, not in the level of a tzaddik." The level of a balchuva. When you get the luchis as a balchuva, that's a much greater level than the level of tzaddikim. And therefore, Hashem says an interesting thing: we don't sit and learn teira and simchas teira. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis is dancing with a closed sefer teira. Everybody dancing equally, because over there, when you learn teira, some people learn better, some people don't learn so well. They're different levels. Dancing with the Teda, a closed Teda, everybody's equal. Everybody has that level of connection to Teda. And that's the difference between Shvuas, the first Luchais, the Jews were on a level of a Tzaddik. The second Luchais, which did not break, by the way, they're the level of Balchu. And therefore, the Gemara says, if the first Luchais would have been given, we would have had Chumash with a little bit of Tanakh, and that's it. All the oral Teda that we have is thanks to the second Luchis. That was the real accomplishment of Teda. Now, when a person learns Teda, Orin, the Ark and the Vesa Migdosh represents, what does the Ark represent? The Ark represents Teda. Like we learn, there's a menorah in our heart, there's a Mizbeach in our heart, there's a Shulchan in our heart. Every part of the Mishkan exists within us. What is the Oren, the Ark of the Beis Amigdash? What is that within the Jew? In the personal Beis Amigdash, that represents Teda. There's two parts to Teda. There's two parts of Teda. There's the learning of the Teda. And then there is the prerequisite, the Bittal of Teda, the nullification of the Jew to learn Teda. We mentioned many times there's a Gemara that says in the daughter, Why was the land destroyed? Why was that just all destroyed? And the Gemara says, Because the Jews didn't say the blessings before learning Torah. Before they learned Torah, they didn't say the blessings. So the question is, big deal. If I put on film without a bracha, I did the mitzvah. I bench lift without a bracha, I did the mitzvah. It doesn't say they didn't learn. They learned, but they didn't make the bracha before learning Torah. What's the problem with that? So Rabbi Yena, Arishan explains, it's brought down by a lot of commentaries already, that what does it mean that they didn't make the bracha before learning? What is the bracha? The bracha of the bracha of that we say every morning and get an aliyah. Baruch <clears> Hashem, <throat> It's God's Torah. In other words, the prerequisite for understanding Torah is first to have the humility to realize it's God's Torah. What does that accomplish? It's very simple. We mentioned this many times in the past. You know, you learn a piece of Gemara, the Gemara doesn't seem to make sense to you. Okay, so in your mind, you think to yourself, it doesn't make sense. Or this custom doesn't make sense. The law doesn't make sense. Okay? That's because you don't realize it's God's Torah. 
If a person would realize it's God's Torah, it's God's wisdom, the question is not why we don't understand. Of course, we can't understand. The point is why we think we understand anything that we think we understand. That's the question. That is the point. The point is when a person learns Torah properly and they realize it's God's Torah, the question is not why I don't understand. The question is, how could I understand? In fact, it brought down an interesting thing. Whoever learns Gemara knows, Gemara never begins from page Aleph. The Gemara always begins from page Beis. Always, every Gemara begins with page Beis. It doesn't have an Aleph in any Gemara. So they say one of the reasons is because a person should always feel they're in the middle of learning. But there's a deeper reason. Because learning Torah is aspect two. Aspect number one is the bittle, the humility to God when you learn Torah. And that's what the Rebbe explains why in the Arden were the Luches and the broken Luches. The Luches, the complete Luches, represent completion, learning, understanding, knowing. What do broken Luches symbolize? The level of humility. It's broken. There's a Yiddish expression. It's, There's nobody as complete as a broken heart. There's nothing as complete as a broken heart. In Yiddish, it's a play of the words. Because the ultimate completeness of learning Taita in the Arin, the Arin just can't have the complete Luchas, which represents understanding and learning and who knows what. Inside the Arin, you need to have the broken Luchas. The Shivre Luchas. The broken Luchas, which represent the level of Bittu. So the Rebbe asks, how can you have these two opposites? Learning means I'm using my head. It's all about me. I understand. I I know. You know, I get it. And Bittu is just the opposite. So the Rebbe asked, how can you have in learning Torah two opposite concepts? From one side, you have to use your head. You can't say, okay, blind faith, blind faith, blind faith. You have to learn and understand it. The oral Torah, if you don't understand, you're not learning halachically. It's not called learning Torah. What is learning Torah? When you understand it. Understand it, that's me. That's my head, that's me. And yet at the same time, it demands bittel. It demands complete nullification of the broken luchis. So the Rebbe says, that's what the Arden is all about. As we learned the other week, the Gemara says, the Arden ena mokim, the Arden ena minamida. The Arden did not take up any place. Remember we learned, the whole Holy of Holies was 20 cubits. The Arden took up two and a half cubits. From one end of the ark to the wall was 10. From the other end of the ark to the wall was 10. And the ark was two and a half, and the whole room was only 20. How could that be? How could that be that 10 plus 10 plus two and a half equals 20? But that was the uniqueness of the Arden. That's the uniqueness of Taita. Taita combines place and above place simultaneously. That's what the Arden represents. It's measurements, two and a half cubits in a 20 cubit room and yet at the same time it didn't take up any measurements and that's what the greatness of a Jew learning Torah from one side we need to use our head and say okay I understand it because it's all about my understanding and I understand and I have to understand it on my level at the same time you need the broken luchis also meaning you need to have the humility that this that you understand is because God's a nice guy and lets us understand his infinite wisdom. Because mathematically, it's impossible for a limited human mind to understand infinite wisdom of God. The answer is God's a bunch of, to, to use coarse language, God's a nice guy. God says, I know I'm infinite. I know my Torah is infinite. You know what? I'm letting, you st- I'm letting your finite minds learn it. And you have to use your head and to the best of your ability, because halachically, 
if you can learn better and you learn not so good, it's called bittle teda. It's called wasting time from teda. It's called not learning teda. A person has to use their head to the fullest. And if they have a good head, they have to do good learning. At the same time, you need to have the total humility that really I shouldn't be understanding anything because the greatest of minds can't understand infinite knowledge. And this is the greatness of Torah with the Arden and the Luchis and the broken Luchis and all of that. Okay, next point. Can I ask you a question? Yes. If somebody is very intelligent and uses their mind properly, but they weren't brought up with emuna or humility or humbleness and all these things. All these characters are really taught. No, no, they're innate. They're not taught. No, they're, you're telling me. They're taught. Uh, humility is taught. People have to understand it's not my brain. It's no, I get it. Brain. Okay, so it has to be taught. But an intellectual person can't because he was never exposed to that. Here, here, to, to that person, everything is a science. Everything is A equals this and B equals this. And to have a Muna and, and, and all these things and, and Bittal and all this is, is taught. Let me ask you a question. Could the greatest mind ever be wrong? Yes. Okay. That itself should cause humility. People, you know, people worship money, people worship food, people worship sports, people worship clothing, people worship a lot of things. People worship intellect. They worship their intellect. And that's idol worshiping. Because intellect is limited. You could be a million Einsteins. It's still a limited head and Hashem's wisdom is unlimited. A person who intellectually, not if you go by Torah, because then you're saying Torah, not what you think. But if a person who intellectually thinks, if I get it, it's right. And if I don't get it, it's wrong. That person is worshiping their own idol of intellect. And therefore it has to be taught. People have to be taught. It's not my ability. It's not my shrewdness in business that makes the money. It's God. I just make the vessel. And that's what the purpose of the broken luchas are, to teach that. Okay, I want to get into another general fundamental point. Starting from the beginning of creation, Hashem created the world. You can understand if Hashem created the world, He created a perfect, perfect world. Mamish, a perfect world. And then Adam and Chava, the day they were created, decided, you know what? Let's eat the apple. Well, eat, not the apple. It wasn't an apple. Let's eat the Eitzadas. Let's eat from the forbidden fruit. Okay? It says in the Medrash and the Pasuk, Neira Alila of the Neodom, God made it happen. God wanted it to happen. God wanted it to happen. It happened. What happened when Adam and Chava sinned? So before they sinned, there was good and bad in the world. There's Eitzadas Tovera. But what was the Eitzadas Tovera? Meaning, before they sinned in the, in, the, in the tree, good was good and evil was evil. They were separated. They were not mixed. The terribleness, there's such a word, of Eitz Adas, Kabbalah explains, Arizal says, that what they did, and this was the evil brought into the world, they homogenized, they mixed good and bad together, that the expression Chazal is, there is no good without bad, and there is no bad without good. What was the terrible sin they did? They didn't. They ate the apple, so people eat the wrong fruits also. Big deal. What did Adam and Chava do with Eitzadas? They actually brought evil into a tangible level into the world that every object that existed in the world now had good and bad. 
Why did God want that to happen? Why did God want that to happen? So let's go through a journey for a few minutes. When Hashem created the world, the purpose of creation was Dira Betachtein, and Hashem wanted a dwelling place down here. Okay? So what did Hashem do? Hashem created a physical world. He created a physical world. But Hashem says, you know what? I made it. I made a perfect world. So like Hashem says, hey, big deal. I can make a perfect world. What's so great about that? Of course, I'm God. I can make a perfect world. So Hashem says, no, you know what? That's no good. I want people to make a perfect world. I want people to make a perfect world. So how, now, if you have a perfect world, how could people make a perfect world perfect? So Hashem says, you know what? I have a plan. I want people to mess up the world. And then let them go fix it. Let them perfect it. So what happened in the Chetet Tzadas, when they brought Zuhamah, which literally, in, it's an Aramaic for filth, impurity into the world. Hashem's plan was to take the perfect world Hashem made and break it, that people should perfect it. So what happened? There's Chetei Tadas. Why? Because Hashem wanted Adam to do true, which he did. Then afterwards, people started sinning again. Another downer. So what did Hashem do? He brought the flood. The flood made an upper, purified the world. The whole world from beginning of creation is ups and downs, downs and ups. Hashem made a perfect world. Adam and Chava sinned, they downed the world. Then they did Shuba, they upped the world. The people sinned again, they downed the world. Mabel made the world again. Ten generations until Avram Avinu downed the world. Avram Avinu came, he upped the world. And the whole thing, Mitzrayim, down the world. What happened by Matan Teira? says in the Zayar, by Matan Teira, the revelation of Matan Teira caused Pascha Zuhamasam, the impurity of the world that was created by Eitzadas ceased to be. Matan Teira put the world into a pre-Chet Eitzadas level. That's what it did. That's what Matan Teda did. The problem is, like we said before, Hashem said, you know, that's great. We gave you the Luchis, Mamish pre Das now. But you know what? This is the Tzaddik level. You, Yes, you guys did it, not me. You Jews did it, but you did it as Sadiqim. There's something I need even greater than that. What did Hashem do? Made the eagle happen. The golden calf of today's parsha. Says in Kabbalah, the Zayar says that when the Jews sinned in the eagle, it was redoing of the Eitzadas. That means the level of impurity that Eitzadas created ceased at Matan Teira. The eagle brought it all back complete uh, destroyed the world again spiritually. Because Hashem says, now I want tshuva. I want a perfect world that people make, Jews make, not as tzaddikim, but as bali tshuva. So Hashem allowed the eagle to happen. They reincarnated the, the chet of etadas. Then it said, okay, we're going upwards now. now the, so they built the mishkan. That was the truth of the Jewish people. They built a Mishkan for God's home. But then Hashem said, still not good enough. Mishkan destroyed. Let's go up, build a base of Migdash. Great, 100% good for 410 years. Hashem said, you know what? I don't, this, still not what I want. So it was destroyed. The Jews built a second base of Migdash. It lasted 420 years. Hashem says, we're not there yet. So Hashem made the Churban base of Migdash. Okay, now we're in Golis. We're in the ultimate downer to get to the world, to get the world to the ultimate 
upper of Dira Betachtainim, of the dwelling place for God, in this world as Bali Tshuva. And this is all the ups and downs that happened throughout Jewish history. The last downer, the Duzer downer, was the destruction of Saka Bismigdash. We're in Golis. After the first base of Mikdash, the Jews were told you're going to be 70 years in exile, and that's it. Now we the lane is Galakita. We don't know how long we're going to be in Golis. This is the ultimate downer of all things. Why? What's the purpose of this ultimate downer? Because Hashem says, now we're coming to the ultimate up, becoming a Mashiach, which is the real Dira Betachtainim. Yisrael Eis in Tshuva, Umiyad Hei Nigon, the Jews do Tshuva, and immediately they'll be redeemed because the Beis Amigdosh, Hashlishi, through Mashiach, is going to be through the level of Tshuva from the Jews' perspective, from the Jews' doing, not from God's doing. And that's why Hashem allowed the eagle to happen because Hashem said, yes, Matan Teiru is a perfect world now, clean, clean no more Eitzadas, but that was Sadiqim level. Hashem said, I want Tshuva. And the Tshuva process started from Matan Teiru, by the way. It started Tshuva, then this happened, first base of English destroyed, second base of English destroyed, and now we're in the ultimate final stages a preparation of Dira Betachtenim for the essence of Hashem to be revealed as the level of Tshuva, which is infinitely greater than Sadiqim. And this is why the Egel in Jewish history plays a very important role. Both in the next, Hashem says, Hashem says in this week's Parsha, anytime I am going to get angry at the Jews, I will bring up the eagle again. I'm never going to forget it. Why? Because this is the ultimate downer for the Jews to be able to do tshuva. When Hashem reminds us constantly of our sin, that's the level of tshuva. And that's why with the Kohen Gadol, went in on Yom Kippur to the Holy of Holies to get forgiveness for the Jewish people, he was not allowed to wear gold. The eight garments of the Kohen and Godel, a lot of it was gold. He was not allowed to wear gold in the Holy of Holies. Why, the Gemara says? Ain Katega Nasa Sanegat. Prosecutor cannot become the defense attorney. He's going into the Holy of Holies to get forgiveness for which sin? For the ego, how can you go in wearing gold? When Hashem is going to say, you want forgiveness for the gold, you're wearing gold. You're going to remind me of the sin. So he went white. But that is what the eagle, the chet the eagle, from a positive perspective, this is all for the sake of coming of a Shiach to elevate the world to the highest of levels. Anyway, um, Wednesday night, Emir Hashem, we're starting Hilchas Pesach, 8 o'clock. Don't forget this Saturday night, you change your clock one hour ahead. But the class will still be 8 o'clock. <clears throat> so this week, next Wednesday, I mean, this Wednesday, we're going to learn preparing the house for Pesach. And then two more weeks after that Wednesday, we'll be learning other dinam of Pesach. So everybody have a great day. Hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you, Rabbi. Everybody Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's only good things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.